this seminar is slightly different from last week's because it's the start of a project I'm working on, um, on journalism under assault in various regions. We're starting with Central and East Europe. And what I thought I'd do today is run you through a little bit about the origins of why we're, where our thinking is on this and go through some of the questions we want to ask. What I'd really like is input from the audience about um, your own experiences. And you'll see at the end there are certain questions and just let me know if there are other things you think should be included in this kind of survey. Because what we're really looking at, trying to look at here is how various pressures on journalism are affecting journalists on the ground doing their daily reporting. And that's what the fellowship, you know, especially this group, last group, Kamal, hi. Um, lots of groups, are, you know, lots of the journalists in this room have very, very direct experience of how political pressure, changes in media ownership, online harassment affect you directly. And I'm trying to get to that level. Um, but if I just start by saying where, you know, where I started from, a, a bit of background. I was in Budapest in April to speak to the Ringier Axel Springer group um, about the business and technical side of journalism. So the focus was really on revenue streams, paywalls, churn rate. And I gave a presentation based on data from our digital news report and a report I wrote at the start of the year about five things you should know about the future of journalism, which looked mainly at the role of platforms, role of misinformation in society. But because we're in Budapest, um, I felt I had to say something about the state of press freedom as well. So I said a few lines at the end. And at the end of the, my presentation, a lot of the people in the room came up to me because they worked for um, Ringyard to Springer. And, they, and one of the com websites it owns is um, actuality.sk in Slovakia. And actuality is an investigative website. And it's the website that Jan Kusiak worked for. Jan Kusiak was an investigative journalist. He was murdered in Slovakia in February 2018, along with his fiance Martina Kuznirova. This was shocking. It's within the European Union. It was a country that had, under communist rule and the, and the transition, not actually had a journalist murdered like this before. So this created this massive state of shock and outcry within society. There were protests. There was kind of sense of something must be done. Um, Ringer Axel Springer put this statement out, which, you know, for a, for a Swiss German group, it's fairly strong. In, in case the crime was meant as an attempt to deter an independent publisher like Ringer Axel Springer, Slovakia from uncovering any infringements, we will use this as an opportunity to be even more conscientious and consistent in fulfilling our journalistic mission. They also swore and carried out their promise to publish all of Jan Kusiak's stories on all their platforms in the Ringer Axel Springer group, but also the pair of Axel Springer group, which is and largest owns some of the largest publications in Europe. <clears throat> the president, uh, the prime minister, um, gave a statement saying he was going to investigate with a really curious photo where he said, I'm going to give a reward of a million euros for, for anyone who finds this killer. And he was photographed like this, standing in front of the million euros. <laughs> now, Jan Kuziak's story was about how the there were links between the Italian mafia and, and um, Slovakian government officials over the misappropriation of EU development funds. So within that context, the idea of a prime minister standing like this, looking a little shifty in front of a pile of money is really extraordinary. As I said, this did trigger a kind of a heartfelt response in Slovakia, and it did end up with um, Robert Fico stepping down, several government ministers resigning. And earlier this week, four men were um, charged with his murder. So there has been progress in this area. But it's exact, and, and short, it's a very public demonstration of how the Slovak public wanted a critical media. And on one hand, it's vaguely reassuring that they received it. But at exactly the same time, this drama was unfolding in Slovakia. If you look at our digital news report, data from Slovakia, um, what you see is the trust in news overall has fallen um, down to 33%, and that less than half, 43%, trust the news they use themselves. So this is much lower than the global average in the digital news report, which says about 44% of respondents trust media most of the time. And at the same time, Slovakia is very, very um, reliant on Facebook for news. About 88% of the people we surveyed in the report either use Facebook or Facebook Messenger for news, and well over a third share news online. So you're in this kind of classic space where online distribution via social platforms is really important, and there's sort of very low trust in the media. So what I wanted to look here in the report is kind of what's happening here in the region. And um, this will eventually form a study that, um, with the support of Ringer Axel Springer, that'll form a study of what's happening to journalists in 16 countries. Um, these are the 16. The seven in bold are the ones we've got data from for the digital news report. 
and I'll go through all of those. But for this survey, I'm just going to look at three, um, Slovakia, Poland, and Hungary. Um, so if I look at those three, and I'm looking at those three because they're the kind of biggest countries in the region with some of the starkest problems in this field. So um, trust in Hungary, unsurprisingly, is shockingly low at 28%. Um, but this figure is quite interesting in that the, the, the figure of um, how much news people how people trust the news they use is 54%. So it's relatively higher than, than in many countries. And this in Hungary is kind of a real example of a polarized society where people trust the news that speaks to them and absolutely don't trust any other space. Um, Poland is a little bit better, but um, overall you just get the sense of things going backwards in the region. And um, there are brilliant investigative report journalists in, the, in these regions, in these countries. There's a uh, a kind of public support for journalism in many ways, but things are going worth backwards and it's worth looking why. And this is something I'm going to talk to the fellows about as well. There are several countries where things are sliding backwards and I think kind of alarm signals and early warning signs are really worth looking at. Um, in all these countries, the crisis of confidence in the media is usually part of a wider narrative about a crisis of confidence in all institutions. And when you're in an environment where you've got low trust in journalism, politics and business, you get an environment where disinformation and popular demagogues can really, really thrive. You then get a very fast downward spiral where demagogues attack journalists, but also all politicians start sniping at journalists, business leaders start sniping at journalists, and that in turn undermines trust even more and creates even more of an environment of kind of populism and extremism. And so um, Central and East Europe here is kind of really fairly obvious as a media space. If you look at the narratives around Western Europe, there's an assumption that you're democracy first and then the kind of creation of an independent media. Whereas in Central and East Europe, we've got a model where the media and democratic institutions emerge together in a period of very rapid and chaotic reform. And so the, the rules are, are there, but they're also easily broken. And you have to look at the role of platform companies in this space um, like I said, you can see that uh, Facebook is really um, important as a platform for news and has a huge role to play here. Um, and in, in all three countries, around 40% of people say they share, share news via social media, messaging or email. So the kind of spread of information via platforms is really important. And in Slovakia in particular, um, one of the reasons our partners who works on our report believes trust has fallen is very specifically over revelations that there was a PR company, a public relations company that worked for politicians and com that normally worked for politicians and companies were creating false social media accounts to then join in political discussions and it kind of created this idea that we, what we're seeing online and all the commentary around news is not real. And Facebook and Google were really mistrusted in these countries also for not having local partners for not um, removing posts on hate speech fast enough. So that's kind of the environment. And um, this, is, you know, this is something that we, the media observers have been looking for a while. So this is a report from UNESCO on the world trends in freedom of expression and media development. And, and this is a focus on Central and East Europe. So it shows quite clearly the progress made in the early 2000s has slowed. There are massively restrictive laws on national security, huge job insecurity amongst journalists. And this is on several levels, it is the very obvious thing of no one's paying for news and so you're not getting paid. You are likely to get fired for being critical. And crucially, as the media gets more and more polarized, if you work for one side of the media, if you work for the pro-government media and for whatever reason you lose your job, it is virtually impossible to get a job on the other side. And the same goes the other way as well. If you work for a small independent outlet and, and that folds your ability to get a job somewhere else is completely different because the idea of journalists as impartial participants in the political process has gone. You're now seen by virtue of the publication you work for as part of the political process. So the concept of neutrality has gone and that really creates a huge set, set, um, sense of job insecurity. Massive um, amounts of self-censorship and once we go off the record, I'm quite really interested to know people's direct experience of this because I, I can't see an environment where everyone freely writes what they want to write, if they are going to come under massive attack, if they're going to lose their jobs, if they're going to jeopardize their future, um, their future careers. And the third one, and the final one is um, the increased pressure against online journalists. Um, all of these points are still true, and but I think in the last year especially, there are kind of, you can really see a sea change in the element of media ownership. Um, so putting it bluntly, foreign media groups have pulled back massively from the region, partly for financial reasons, partly for political reasons, often a combination of both. Ringer Axel Springer, despite its very lauded course, um, sold a lot of its printed companies um, in Slovakia, though it did keep hold of actuality.sk. Um, and Bauer Media also sold several magazines 
Um, but it's completely stark in Hungary, and I won't go into too much detail here, but there's a huge overhaul in the Hungarian media landscape here. Um, Viktor Orban's rival, Lajos Simiska, basically gave up on the media sector and sold all his assets. Several publications closed down, including Zoom.hu, that was showing a lot of potential as an online news portal. And what you also have in Hungary is this quite extraordinary creation of something called the Central European Press and Media Foundation. It comprises of 476 media companies, many of which were donated to the fund. Um, this has mean, that meant this media companies have stopped, um, long time ago, stopped being journalists and have tipped over into direct propaganda, where they will cover the government line in identical ways. The front pages will all have exactly the same story and exactly the same headline. Poland is not as stark. Um, but at one point, it really did like the media in Poland was going to bloom. It was going, you know, the Gazette of was founded in 1989 um, with a kind of healthy critical line to the government. But what you see there now is, again, it's kind of pressure on media ownership um, with the Law and Justice Party in particular, having really followed the Hungarian playbook to control the media and consolidate ownership and put political appointments in the state broadcasters. Now, within this environment, um, the other reason Central and East Europe is really interested from journalism space is you have this, but you also have a kind of completely new forms of journalism. Most of it's digital and a lot of it is transnational. So there's been a huge rise in cross-border investigative reporting across um, Central and East Europe, much of it funded by foundations, but also through crowdfunding. It's kind of a different relationship between the audience and readers that we're talking about elsewhere. And it's very striking that you see it in... In, in this region. Um, but this in itself, again, puts journalists at risk. So, um, again, going back to when Jan Kosiak, got Jan Kosiak, when he died, one of his colleagues pointed out that the Slovak meat mafia didn't tend to kill journalists, but the Calabrian mafia from Italy did. So, um, so he was a victim of this cross-border cooperation as well. Um, the same is very true of Daphne Car Caruana Galizia in Malta, the Maltese journalist who was assassinated her son has been very clear that she was investigating the Maltese government, but also kind of international links. And she was working on issues uncovered by the Panama Papers, which is going to kind of an example of cross-border <laughs> nationalism. So we have to be very careful about where the, who, who is responsible for protecting journalists in this field, who looks after their security, who takes responsibility if they're killed, who <coughs> takes responsibility for making sure that their killers are brought to justice. Is it national governments or is it some other kind of body? Um, in Hungary, Direct 36 um, has done huge deep dives into government corruption, and its editor there again has spoken openly about being regularly doxxed, attacked online by, by government sources. And these are the ones we know about. These are the ones where they have editors who are willing to speak out and carry on reporting. But, I'm, but there, are, there are lots and lots of people who will come under this overwhelming attack and then, and then stop, and you can't really blame them. So in this context, what I wanted to do um, with this project is to survey the journalists who are directly affected. So we can see the overarching picture of kind of changing media ownership, restricted legislation. But I wanted to get a sense of what's happening on the ground, especially on the online space. And it's very clear there are orchestrated attacks against journalists. This slide came through. Um, so this next slide didn't actually show up. But um, if the reporter on Frontier has analysed the kind of modus operandi of press freedom predators who orchestrate their online attacks against journalists, and they've kind of divided this into three stages. The first one is disinformation, and this is where kind of journalistic content on social networks is drowned in a flood of fake news and pro-government content, so it becomes impossible to know what's real journalism and what's propaganda and what's fake. A lot of our research, again, at the Reuters Institute shows that when people talk about fake news, they put all this stuff into this category, so they don't just talk about deliberate disinformation, they talk about bad journalism, they talk about propaganda, So, and that in turn reduces trust in the media. So this is kind of a very effective way of discrediting the media. And the other one is by amplification, so that's the impact of pro-government content, um, artificially enhanced by commentators who are paid by the government to post messages on social networks or by bots, computer-generated programs that kind of gen computer-generated programs that automatically generate posts. Um, and, you know, when you look at some of the coverage, even around Brexit, you see some com comments that you're fairly sure are triggered by bots. They're, they're, they're Twitter profiles with someone with 300 followers who is just tweeting kind of one-line repudiations of various arguments. And then the third one is intimidation. So journalists are personally targeted, insulted, threatened, 
in order to discredit them, reduce them into silence. There's a lot of literature on this, on focusing on women, because women are the targets of online harassment far more than men. Um, but across the board, it tends to be younger, less experienced, um, less well-paid journalists who are often the um, targets of these attacks. And um, But there are also other ways to intimidate and press, and that's kind of what I wanted to look at in, with the study. So what I was going to do was send out a survey to journalists in the region with um, with kind of set of questions and the quite broad questions to give space to uh, um, to argue to draw out what they're thinking about and this is what I wanted to look at is what are you most concerned about in your countries what stops you reporting the way you feel comfortable reporting and this could be freedom of information laws it could be pressure from advertisers over advertorial uh, over editorial pressure from media owners these three are um, fairly common worldwide actually even in Britain you'll have these three pressures on journalists in different ways or perception of these pressures in different ways. Threats of lawsuits against journalists is a surprisingly effective way of suppressing journalism. Most media houses cannot afford to defend their <coughs> stories, so you don't need to actually file a lawsuit, you just need to threaten one or give off the impression that you will threaten one is enough to kind of convince a lot of editors. Censorship, this is rarely overt anymore, um, but there is a tremendous amount of self-censorship in this space where journalists don't feel able to write the stories they want to write on several levels. Partly they feel, don't feel confident enough that they'll be given the time and the resources to cover the story completely accurately and the tiniest mistake will leave you open to attack online. So you've got to be 100% certain of your sourcing of your facts. If you're not, you'd rather not run the story at all. So um, there's not much space for human error. There's not much space um, as editors have been cut fines and penalties, and this can be um, through lawsuits, but it can also be it through legislation that um, orders platforms to take down fake news, or fines companies for promoting hate speech. There's a whole array of penalties that can be levied against journalists that aren't meant to be laws about journalism, they're meant to be laws about hate speech or, or um, various other aspects of, under the guise of protecting minorities or protecting certain groups can be really used to clamp down journalists. And the final one is um, hate speech laws, which we all kind of know and are fully aware that while these are meant to certain groups, they're often in many countries used to also kind of suppress journalism. Uh, this is the story I was trying to, this is a slide I was trying to put earlier. And so what we want to divide the threats into are these kind of divided, are they kind of online threats, physical threats, legal threats, and criticism from politicians. And once we break that down, what we want to try and do is see what, what could help. And one idea is how much is solidarity of use in this space? So the first question is, do you feel supported as a journalist when you come under attack? Do you feel that your editors have your back, that your colleagues have your back, that the public has your back? Um, do, do you feel you can understand that the readers and the audiences will understand what you're trying to do with the story? Um, and then the kind of the bigger point is unions. We're seeing a massive demise in labor unions and certainly in press unions, journalism unions. But is there a role they can play? In much of Western Europe, the unions still tend to act in favor of the older legacy media and the older legacy journalists. So they will do a lot to protect the employment rights of the older journalists, but they're not in the space of protecting the rights of younger journalists who can be freelancers, who have signed different employment contracts and are facing different threats. Honestly, the threat is not being sacked by your editor, but but um, but having rape threats sent to your house. And I'm not sure that unions and, and um, movements have kind of understood that yet. Um, yeah. So so yeah, that's kind of it. There's more data, but that's um, which we can bring into discussion. But I just really like to open this up um, into a discussion over these points and to also say. Let's switch off the live stream now and um, kind of talk about this issue. But thank you.